Good afternoon. Good morning still, I guess. Um, I'm Andy Winkler. As Jen said, I'm the director of the Housing and Infrastructure Project at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, that is a real thing. It, it's in Washington, D.C. We were founded about 15 years ago by four former Senate majority leaders to actively promote bipartisan solutions and consensus building in Washington. Um, and so we, we relaunched our, our task force on disaster response reform uh, this summer, uh, added a very lovely new member, Jen, uh, who allowed us to kind of take over a little piece of this uh, conference and, and have some of our own events. And we have Stan and Chauncia, who are members of the task force. A few others are around here, Reese May. Um, I don't know who else is here. But um, we, we were offered the opportunity to have a little focus group um, with a handful of you um, yesterday and talk through some of the questions that we're really interested in. Um, because as Jen said about the last presentation, um, you know, it's important that our policies, our programs, our systems are responsive to the needs of people who have been through disasters. Um, and by no stretch of the imagination is the Federal Disaster Assistance System been designed um, by disaster survivors. Um, so many pieces of the system don't work. Um, but there really is, what we see is a bipartisan opportunity to address some of those issues. Um, so we're gonna turn it over to Krista to talk a little bit about some of what we heard um, yesterday in the focus group and then hopefully open it up a little bit to get broader input from all of you. Um, our goal at the end of the day is to, to really change policy in Washington. You know, we're not a normal think tank. We, we don't just put out white papers and recommendations in a vacuum. We go and advocate for them. Um, and I think despite the potentially pending government shutdown, there is a real opportunity to address um, some of the issues that we have around federal disaster assistance. Good morning, everyone. Um, as we're getting through the slides, I um, wanted to sh just kind of summarize, um, and we're going to give you an opportunity here during our conversation uh, to add your input, um, just as we asked the, group, the focus group yesterday. But to summarize a few things that came up uh, within our focus group, and it was based a lot on the conversations we've been having since we all showed up on Tuesday. Um, advocating for more standardization in grant processes, right? We know right now there are grants out there, and I'm gonna throw a lot of acronyms, and there's a point to this. BIL, IJA, ARPA, CARES, IRA. I mean, you name it. Why are we creating multiple funding streams with multiple rule sets when we have existing rule grant streams everyone's familiar with, and we could just add more money to those. <laughs> we could create less complication at the local level because what I've heard from local jurisdictions is, I don't have time to apply for, to a new grant stream. I don't have the knowledge or the base to run a new program, to hire a new vendor to do this. I already know how to do the Department of Homeland Security grant. I've been doing it for years. Just add more money to that, right? So that was one theme. Another was preparedness. I know, having started my roots in preparedness, preparedness is not terribly exciting sometimes, right? Response can be exciting. You know, the beginnings of recovery is exciting, not the end of recovery because it's 10 years, 20, 15 years later. But the beginning is exciting. Preparedness isn't necessarily there, but that's what gets everybody safe. That's what everybody's practice. I think about when Julie talked about preparing with your animals and practicing that. That's what keeps people safe in that moment of stress. Technical assistance is so important. And technical assistance doesn't have to be formal. It can be you reaching out to a colleague and saying, I met you at the wildfire conference. <laughs> I remember you said this. I'm now in this predicament. Can you help me? Right? So providing each other technical assistance and support is so important. Flexibility of spending of funds based on rules and based on recipient of funds. Some of our NGOs said we have greater flexibility, so run some of those funds through our NGOs who can make the funds work in a different way or can maximize it, right? You can have an NGO do the physical labor and then the funds supply the, the, the materials. 
And then finally, think about sustainability from an individual and a community level. Um, think about it as if we have an equitable landscape at the beginning prior to an event, we will have a more sustainable community because that hit when that disaster occurs won't be so dramatic. Um, so m pulling equity into all that we do, but thinking about it before an event, making sure that we're creating equity in our communities so that the, the after effect of an event is not so dramatic. Um, and maybe real quick, both Stan and Chauncey, if you can take a minute since you didn't have to suffer with a big photo up on the slide uh, to introduce yourselves. All right. Uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone. I'm Chancia Willis. I'm the CEO and co-founder for the Institute for Diversity and Inclusion and Emergency Management. That's IDEM. Uh, I'm a longtime emergency manager. I've been in emergency management for about 24 years, serving at different levels of government. Uh, and private sector. Now my primary focus and the focus of our organization is on empowering communities across the United States and in some parts of um, the world to become more resilient to climate change impacts. And um, particularly we're focused on underserved, forgotten communities, those that have been muted and not offered an opportunity to advocate on their behalf. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Stan Gimont, and I'm a se senior advisor for community recovery with Haggerty Consulting, which is an emergency management and uh, disaster recovery firm. Um, these days, I also uh, am a, a subject matter expert uh, for the uh, BPC uh, uh, Disaster Reform Task Force, and uh, very happy to be here today. Uh, first met Jen uh, probably about 2018 after the 2017 fires when she came to Washington with uh, 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 Sonoma County officials and, and business leaders to advocate for uh, funding for the recovery from the uh, uh, 2017 fires. Uh, in those days, uh, I was with the Department of Housing and Urban Development in Washington. Uh, I was with HUD for 32 years and uh, was responsible for running uh, the entire uh, collection of community development block grant programs, including the disaster recovery component uh, from 2008 through 2019. And so I'm happy to be here and uh, take part in this, uh, in, in this effort. Thank you. And so maybe uh, Chauncey and Stan, you can add to Krista's kind of takeaways from the focus group yesterday. And then we we want you to be thinking about these questions up here, because while we had the opportunity to hear from a smaller group of folks who are attending the summit, um, we didn't get to hear from everybody. And the real goal for us, um, kind of like Jen said, this gives us an opportunity to, to get out of our little Washington bubble. Um, you know, yesterday, the day before, I've been sitting in the back, listening, learning from all of you. Um, th this is also an opportunity for us to continue that. So Stan Chauncey. I love that. And um, I'll say that yesterday was particularly impactful for me because I got to hear from so many who have experienced um, a disaster of epic proportions firsthand. And you know, from my perspective, we go out into communities uh, frequently and we hear from survivors. Yesterday, we heard the same refrain that we've heard before, which is, why weren't we offered the opportunity to be prepared before this disaster happened? And when we're um, highlighting the needs of particularly underserved communities, there is a disconnect sometimes. And I also mentioned that um, as the former emergency manager for Tampa, Florida, I can understand the perspective of emergency managers. It's difficult to prepare the entire community with a one or two person staff, right? It's like it's designed to fail. Um, there's no win here. So what we have to do as emergency managers, and I know there are a few here, is really take the time to prioritize the communities that are most vulnerable the ones that do not have insurance, that will not be able to rebuild, that will not have um, a shorter uh, recovery time frame, They need to be prioritized in the beginning as well as everyone else. That means we have to be more intentional 
to provide the exercises, the training, provide the um, pre-planned activities so that when there's a disaster, there's less chaos and there's a clear path to recovery for everyone, not just some. So one of the takeaways uh, I, for me yesterday was uh, what I'm going to characterize as a need for greater clarity on a, on a whole range of issues in, in uh, uh, response and recovery. Uh, you know, with regard uh, to uh, you know, preparedness, uh, uh, picking up on Chauncey's theme, uh, there, there needs to be a, you know, significantly greater focus, uh, on, on the, uh, importance of preparedness and, and being, uh, uh, being ready to go and respond when something happens and also to understand what's ne going to be necessary for recovery. So there needs to be more th forethought, uh, you know, with regard to, uh, how to respond and how to recover. You know, one of the, the things that I have been talking about in a number of different uh, uh, appearances over the last year or so is, you know, it's, it is unfortunately becoming uh, more and more common that there is a need in the wake of a natural disaster to rebuild full communities. So the idea that you lose thousands of uh, housing units in places uh, like Sonoma or, uh, or in Paradise uh, or last year, a hurricane, um, uh, ENS, it struck Lee County, Florida, 18,000, uh, housing units severely damaged or lost. How do you, how do you think about preparing for that? And there's so little thought given to how do you, how do you, how do you address that recovery? Uh, there's also a need for clarity, uh, you know, at a, a more granular level granular level uh, for disaster survivors personally, because so many of the processes that, that uh, touch upon individuals' lives uh, are not clear to them. You know, a lot of discussion uh, with regard to uh, registration for FEMA IA and declinations for assistance under FEMA IA. Uh, and the idea that a, 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 a declination on the front end in the first instance is not that you will not get assistance, but that there, there's something lacking, potentially lacking in the, uh, in the application. You need to ensure that people understand to pursue the appeals processes. So the, the, that kind of clarity to the individual uh, is, is important. Uh, so as I, again, as I think about this, uh, clarity across the board is really an important concept uh, and, and needs to be integrated uh, throughout what uh, uh, governmental entities are doing to respond uh, post-disaster. Anything to add, Chris? Sir? Yeah, I was just thinking there were a couple of themes, even as Stan and Chauncea were talking, um, we talk a lot about FEMA individual assistance, and I think we think about it in the very small space of the funding that's given to households. And it provides a lot more than just that. It provides mental health assistance, funeral assistance, dental assistance. There's so many facets to it. And then we talk about CDBGDR. And that comes from HUD, and we know that it comes years later. But there are so many other resources out there. We've heard from NGOs, some of our voluntary organizations, active in disaster, who provide direct assistance to households. So understanding who they are, understanding that the USDA has funding available to disaster survivors post-event. Um, and then there are other federal agencies and state agencies that provide assistance. So we have to do a better job on the front end, not just talking about um, applying for IA and getting your paperwork ready for that or for CDBGDR, but all the resources out there. Because typically in someone's survivor journey, it's not one thing that helps you become whole again, right? It is this piece over here and this piece over there and that piece over there. And so understanding the complex nature. And if I had my magic wand, I would say we could put that all under one roof and make it one application and make it easy. Um, I would also say that we would have a FEMA process that doesn't require us to tell people to appeal. You would actually just get it to start with um, and not have to go through all those layers, right? I would simplify the process. We're not there yet. We're still advocating for it. We're not there yet. But in the meantime, we have to do a better job understanding the full spectrum and not just that one layer of it. Um, and maybe before we kind of open it up to, to a broader conversation about all of these questions, um, 
Can we talk a little bit about the the realm of the possible? So I I think you know we often get very discouraged watching news in in Washington. We're we're pretty close to a government shutdown, um, and if we can't agree on basic things like how to fund the government uh, to make sure our programs continue and are working, um, you know what where does it leave reforms like this? Um, but I actually see a, a a ton of different flurry of bills um, that are intended to make this system work better. People are listening and they've heard, oh, we need to try a, a, a single application. We need better data sharing. We need X, Y, Z. But um, I was wondering, Stan, maybe you could talk first about how it's been piecemeal and the problem with that. And then maybe, Chris, to some of those bills that I know you've helped to even provide technical assistance on input and where those stand. So as we uh, think about a, a couple of these major programs that uh, are key to uh, federal long-term recovery, and, and I'll co focus on, on sort of the, the recovery aspect uh, of things, um, you know, their roots go back 30 years, 35 years, 50 years. I mean, when you think about the Stafford Act originally enacted in the, in the 1980s. Uh, if you consider the CDBG program, and, and we heard from Heather yesterday about how that really isn't a program, the CDBG DR program, it's based on a on a uh, a statute from 1974. So next year is 50 years for for CDBG. Um, one of the things that has happened over time uh, with Congress uh, is that they've kind of given up a bit on their uh, effective oversight responsibilities. Uh, there was a time at which uh, programs were reauthorized on a regular basis. There was reconsideration of, the, of these programs, um, you know, kind of a sorting out of what worked, what didn't work. That process has kind of gone away in the last 25 to 30 years. It, it doesn't really happen. If you look at the CDBG program, the, the uh, underlying basic program hasn't been reauthorized by Congress since 1992. What happens, Congress just appropriates money to the program every year, but they really haven't had any sort of uh, substantive uh, review uh, of, of the program in years. Uh, on the Stafford Act side, again, uh, there are uh, changes made here and there. There was the 2018 uh, Disa uh, Disaster Reform Recovery Act, uh, which made a number of different changes to uh, 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 to the Stafford Act and implemented the the BRIC program, uh, so it 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 adds some things, does a few things, but it's not sort of a comprehensive overhaul that begins to address the um, you know what are what are clearly pressing needs out there about how how the individual assistance programs function, how the PA programs function, how to streamline those things and make them more responsive to what the emerging needs are. Uh, in, in long-term disaster recovery. So uh, what we see a lot of in these days from Congress is sort of a piecemealing effect, is that you know, they'll, they'll take a bite at one thing. So right now, uh, we've, we've been commenting on legislation to improve uh, data exchange between federal agencies uh, and, and uh, uh, state and local government uh, consumers of that information. It is a hard thing to do to navigate uh, all the uh, ins and outs of, of data privacy and, and to get everybody to agree on that. Uh, there has also uh, been an effort to uh, simplify and improve uh, the application process to create a more uniform single portal for federal assistance. Uh, but that's going to require a lot of different congressional committees to work together to align what uh, various agencies do uh, in order to make uh, make that process work better for the disaster survivor. And it's, again, a hard thing to do. And But these are all just sort of piecemeal. Uh, there's no real overlook, you know, overarching effort to make these things work together, make these programs knit together in a way that's more effective for uh, the people who have to m implement them at the state and the local level. Yeah, so a couple um, successes, as Stan alluded, the Disaster Survivor Fairness Act um, is looking to create some legislation around that single stream application, disaster survivor at the federal level. I'm going to caveat that. 
There are states that are making movements to make a state level single, single stream, and then the voluntary organizations are also looking at the possibility of that. So it still wouldn't get to just one application overall, but it would get us in a better place of 20 or 30 applications. Um, a couple of other things I want to note, the SBA was recently successful in their disaster loan program in getting past um, a higher loan amount. So for the longest while, the max amount of loan you could get post-disaster was $250,000. It is now almost double that, which is huge because we know the cost of housing and rebuilding has gone up. Um, I'm a huge advocate for that. It's, it's a complicated program and you do have to qualify income level. However, it is at such a low interest rate. I've watched disaster survivors actually roll their mortgage as well as the rebuild into that. And they've dropped their overall mortgage payment and their disaster loan, which has allowed them then to financially pay off their house even sooner. Um, so there are benefits to that program. In addition to the max amount for the rebuild under SBA, they've now allowed additional funds for mitigation. And then they changed that. They added to that to say, not only do we want to allow you to mitigate against the current peril, so mega fire or um, flood or whatever have you, but we want you to be able to mitigate your home towards anything that you're at risk, any peril. Um, so they, again, are thinking outside the box. The next thing I know, because I have some insight insight um, <laughs> into what SBA is working on, they are also advocating that your SBA loan not be considered a duplication of benefit under the other programs. And Stan will probably have some thoughts on that. But what SBA says is ours is a loan. It's not a grant. So it shouldn't count against you if you're applying for a disaster grant because they're requiring people to pay that back. And I know Jen's done great work that we've heard about um, on the uh, IRS side, you know, and tax uh, implications to your payouts from um, your insurance companies and so forth and so and utilities so again there are great strides being made um, and I can, even want to highlight a few things that I'm seeing at states um, Texas made a pass at making sure that homeowners or home buyers were aware of the perils that existed at the home they're buying and they went a step further finally. <laughs> it took us about six years to get there, but also for renters. For the longest while, renters didn't have rights. They rented a home without knowledge of what hazards exist for that rental unit. And now in the state, you have to be made aware by your landlord. So we're seeing great successes when it comes to policy. And if you can't tell, I'm a policy nerd, I love it. Um, if you ask me about my favorite books, I have a litany you know, ostrich paradox, all sorts of stuff that you should be reading because you should be a nerd like me when it comes to disasters. Uh, and now I want to turn it to, so Chauncey, you mentioned some other legislation that you've had a, had a little bit of a role in and what you think might be possible with that. Yeah, so today is an exciting day. Um, today there uh, is a reintroduction for the uh, FEMA Equity Act to uh, really address the uh, inequities in disaster response. And so we believe, and we did provide some of the language for the um, act, and we're hoping that it's successful, but we think uh, as an organization that this will assist in ensuring that marginalized communities are heard and that their needs are prioritized. And we know that vulnerable communities, including honestly renters, because they have always been seen as transient and not a real part of any community. Isn't that crazy? So even renters, even those who really don't have a seat at the table always, um, they will be prioritized and um, FEMA has uh, really the onus to be held accountable to ensure they are considered and their needs are, are considered. So I'm not a policy nerd, um, but I've always wanted to be as, as well as have Whitney Houston's voice. So anyway. Same. <laughs> um, okay. So I, I thought hopefully we could, we could open up it up um, not only to, um, to questions. If you have questions for, for Stan, Christopher, Chauncey, Stan, has the deepest possible knowledge of CDBGDR 
humanly possible. He literally this summer wrote a handbook on CDBGDR. Um, so if, if you happen to be working with that program, didn't have an opportunity to ask maybe Heather a question yesterday, now might be your chance. Um, same for Krista, Chauncea. Um, but we would also like to hear for those of you who weren't part of the focus group yesterday, or even if you were, um, to, to Jen's point, if you were to reverse engineer federal programs to make them more responsive to your needs, and I know it is a little funny, maybe you don't think it's possible, maybe it's exhausting, if only yes, but it's, I think it is possible. I work for a bipartisan organization, so I have to be an eternal optimist. Um, and we will go work hard to make these things happen. Um, we would love to hear from you, even if it's tiny, even if it's simple, what would have made your life easier? And I'm guessing you have many, many things to say, so please do. Hi, Monica Johnny with DSW Homes. We're a general contractor. So I love what your organization does and stands for. And so when it comes to serve, serving marginalized communities um, post-disaster, how much of that do you believe also has to do with the diversity at the leadership level at the state or the grantee when it comes to developing policies? Uh, working in the state of North Carolina, we served a population of majority African Americans and Hispanic, and it was a struggle getting my colleagues to translate things into Spanish. Um, we also had a Vietnamese a population that we were just struggling to serve, and so um, there was a lack of understanding from some of my colleagues on the importance of having translated documents, going out and having case managers that also spoke the language. That way, you know, we were clearly explaining our policies um, and all the guidelines on submitting a, a proper application. So, do you believe that HUD or FEMA should do better about um, coordinating with states on, you know, hiring more diverse leaders or and then diversity doesn't have to be just ethnic or race. It could be socioeconomic background, um, you know, where people grew up across the state or the country. What are your thoughts on that? I love that question. So um, when I think of diversity, right, I think of excellence. I don't think of difference. Diversity leads to excellence. Excellence in service delivery, excellence in thought, excellence in shared perspective and divergent perspective it yields excellence. So when we have diverse leaders who are establishing policy, offering adaptive policy, and in many cases looking to um, produce restorative policy, we know that diversity and excellence is needed in that space. So yes, when there's an absence of excellence, you get the outcome it's not going to be great. So when you think about it that way, we have to have more um, perspective. We need older Americans. We need younger Americans at the table. We need people of different uh, backgrounds, different religions, different races. We need diversity, that excellence in leadership in all areas because the outcome for the people who are impacted is better it becomes greater. So yes, more work needs to be done and states can be held accountable through funding. You remember when we had to integrate the ICS system? Kudos to California for developing the uh, incident command system, obviously, but you know, it can be done through funding, restrictive funding. And as far as um, NGOs who lack diversity as well, um, they also are not going to be producing the excellent outcomes that are needed for people. And so, once again, accountability, restriction of funding. And some NGOs, obviously, are, are dinosaurs. And they've been operating with the same process, the same mindset for years. And unfortunately, the same underwhelming impacts. So I, I would come back to uh, my comments with regard to clarity, and it's important that everybody in the community understand what what the what the game plan is, be it for uh, 
community recovery or individual recovery and, and, and what the resources and what the options are. So this gets to one of these issues about, well, how effective um, are federal agencies and then all, ultimately state and local officials, um, you know, implementing the requirements that are already applicable. And so uh, what I, I don't see Heather here, maybe she's, she's already gone, but if you wanna see a, a state that actually kind of does a lot of uh, outreach here with regard to um, providing materials in multiple languages, go to the Texas GLO website for, for CDBGDR. Uh, they've got materials out there in at least six different languages, I believe. Uh, 13 now? Uh, so uh, I, when you look at the, the face page, I think I saw like six or so, but they may have more below that. But, you know, there, there is a requirement that, you know, where, where the HUD funding is uh, involved, where uh, it's supposed to do a, an evaluation of a, uh, populations with limited English proficiency. And, and then uh, in providing their materials with regard to the programs, you know, provided in those particular languages if they meet certain thresholds. And then again, to the extent that there are uh, smaller populations uh, within a given community that have uh, particular language needs, you know, there's a directive to make that, that kind of assistance available as necessary. So the question becomes, how is that effectively implemented out there at, at the state and local level? Is our agency such as HUD and FEMA are they making folks do what is required by the, you know, by the by law or by regulation? Uh, so there is some follow through there, but there's, it's, let's face it, there's an expense associated with it because you, you've got to have interpreters. It takes time to interpret things and put them online. Uh, so there's got to be a, a commitment and an effort there, and there's also got to be a funding stream associated with providing that kind of service. You know, that can be funded, again, both out of uh, HUD and, and FEMA funds, but there's got to be an understanding of what the requirement is, and there's got to be a commitment to getting it done. Great. Hi, I'm Megan Ferguson. I'm with Impact, Devel Over this way. Impact Development Fund. Um, we're a CDFI serving the state of Colorado and neighboring states. Um, to the earlier point of continuity of, of resources and getting things under one roof, um, I would encourage you to, to look at CDFIs as a resource for that service. We currently, with um, Marshall Fire in Boulder County, uh, currently have seven different programs, funding streams, pots of money from CDBG DR to state funds to county use tax rebates to unmet need to foundation and philanthropic dollars also electrification incentives, home hardening rebates. So seven different programs, all with different pots of money, all under one roof. And what we've seen is that absolutely amplifies how the survivor can come in through one portal, be reviewed for everything that they're eligible for, and it also helps um, just logistically with duplication of benefit. When we have the resources, the capital sources all in house, for the most part, we know what the funding award or the adjustments are for that survivor and can make the appropriate adjustments for DOB purposes on CDBGDR. So I, I would say um, consider that as a resource, especially at the federal level. Um, we've also talked about just the continuity of that service being ready being prepared, not having to go through a year to two years of framework set up to make sure that this resource is available, but that requires funding, right? That requires operational support to make sure that that framework and that team can be supported, you know, as long-term recovery wanes and the next disaster comes. So um, thank you for, for that. Sure. Yeah, let, let me just uh, use that as a bit of an example about uh, the kind of things that need to be done you know, in Washington to make that work. So CDFI is operated out of the Treasury Department. We haven't had a lot of contact at this point with Treasury Department, but but picking up on your thread, that's one of the things we ought to be doing is talking to the folks at the CDFI fund with regard to you know how can we better integrate uh, 
uh, uh, uh, CDFIs into the longer term disaster re re response. Um, you know, when you look at some of these um, uh, substantial uh, uh, appropriations bills that Congress comes up with in response to disasters, and and one of you know one of them sort of forming as as we speak, if you will. Um, what you see in there are a couple of very large appropriations for a couple of agencies, you know, money for, for FEMA for the Disaster Recovery Fund, the DRF, which right now is almost broke. Uh, you see funding for CDBGDR. Uh, you see funding for a handful of, of other efforts. But then there are also other agencies, and there can be dozens of them. You look at some of these, these bills, like after Hurricane Sandy, after Irma Maria um, and Harvey in 2017, and you're going to see money going to 50, 60 different agencies across the government. And everybody's got a different approach to how they're going to hand it out, the timelines in which they're going to hand it out. Again, clarity on what's going on is important, and, and that's got to start at the federal level. But, uh, you know, clearly we need to make a make that effort with, with organization, you know, uh, uh, agencies that are responsible for entities such as CDFIs, as well as other agencies, be it, be it interior or, or ag or, uh, or EPA transportation, it, this needs to be knit together in a more effective way. And this is where, you know, the lack of sort of a comprehensive focus on disaster recovery is, is, is kind of failing communities across the country. Well, hi everybody. I'm Chris Scottley. Um, up until recently, I served as a director of emergency management here in Sonoma County. I recently moved on to academia, so I'm no longer as useful as I used to be. Um, but having chased the dragon here a little bit at the state and federal level, I want to applaud the task force efforts because to use a football analogy, we've got to continue running the ball up the middle. We've got to continue to look for evolution and reform for change after each of these disasters, after all the experiences that are putting in, and hopefully we can move that ball. But I will suggest there's another way to play football, and that is where you throw the ball a long way down the field all at once. Uh, 49er fans way back, okay. And what I'm gonna suggest is we've had some success locally in local governments by having the ideal outcome in a binder on the shelf and at 3 a.m., when there's panic and craziness, not even the politicians are willing to listen, you just drop it on the table and you say, this will fix everything. So I'm gonna suggest proceeding up the middle, but also what is that end state? What does it look like to actually have recovery be a viable unity of effort approach from the federal government? Recommendations like, oh no, HUD no longer gets disaster grant money. No, no, no. It's gonna be one disaster grant fund agency. We're going to consolidate and streamline these efforts because locals can't play this game. They're outgunned. They're totally outgunned by the paper pushers. We cannot comply. I mean, I tried hard. We hired people. We just got beat up too hard. What I'm going to suggest is we should design what we want to see in the year 2035. I know that's a long way from now, but have that on the shelf ready to go. And so when the next Katrina or the next truly catastrophic disaster hits this country, not isolated communities, but truly impacts a region or the GDP, God forbid, that we have something that can be lifted up by legislators. And we won't get it. They're not going to just take your binder and go, oh, that's great, let's do that. But they may take whole chapters out of it. The incident command system that you talked about came out of the Malibu fires because of crisis. The standardized emergency management system in California came out of our experience in 1991 or 1993 when there was this panic about what to do. Now, I'm going to suggest with climate change, especially the intersection of failing infrastructure and aging population, that in the next 10 years, there will be something very bad and horrible that happens in the United States. And that is the opportunity for us to come in with that Hail Mary pass. I love that. We play football, not very well, but we do play. Um, and I like that, throwing the long ball. I think um, changes are going to have to be made because we are accustomed as emergency managers and as a population of dealing with one disaster singularly. But now we're seeing compounding disasters. It's going to get even more muddled. 
So if we don't get in front of it now, then we are going to be in a crisis of paperwork and the funding will stop again. So I know you want to speak to that. When you said football, his eyes lit up. So um, what I would say is that uh, we're, we're trying, we're actually working on something of a similar nature right now. It, come back to the idea that uh, was expressed by former chief of staff for President Obama, Rahm Emanuel, said don't let a good, good uh, crisis go to waste. So you, you are correct. You do need to be prepared. And you do need to have something written down. Because one of my experience, experiences in my many years in Washington is he who comes to the table with something written down just dominates the conversation. You, you may not be 100% of what you propose at the, on day one, but I'm going to tell you what, you're probably going to see 75 or 80 percent of it, but you gotta you gotta do the work in advance and have an idea and have one that hangs together effectively. Uh, what I will say is that I think it just given the nature of of the way Congress works, I don't hold hope out for one singular grant. I think you can narrow it down to a handful, but I don't think you ever get to one just because of the considerations of various you know, congressional committees and their jurisdictions over agencies. Nobody wants to give anything up. You can narrow it down, I think, ultimately, but I, I don't think you can ever quite get to one. I well, I just want to add to, to Stan and appreciate the insight. Um, you know, I've worked at BPC coming up on eight, nine years, um, and one of the projects that I worked on when I first started was around infrastructure funding and finance. Um, and that, you know, we put out a report eight years ago. We do have the bipartisan infrastructure law. Is it perfect? No, but it took people saying for 10, 20 years, we need a significant investment in infrastructure funding in this country for that to eventually happen. And I think the parallel is similar. Hi, I'm Ivan. I'm with WUI. Uh, we work on the mitigation side. So the last um, uh, item up here on your screen how can federal programs better support building resilience and prepare? Um, I was curious if you've looked at any research on the efficacy of the rebate programs versus other mechanisms for incentivizing work to get done, like tax credits, for example. Uh, the, the background here is if you get a rebate, now there's a, an administrative overhead involved. There's quite a bit of money that goes into just managing the project. And then there has to be uh, typically a 1099. So the tax, the, the recipient of the rebate gets taxed on that amount. So it's automatically reduced in effectiveness by 20, 30 percent. Um, whereas tax credits we've used to get all kinds of things done. I um, was curious if that's come up in your research. Uh, I don't know that it's come up in our research specifically related to wildfires, but I think there's a natural tendency in Washington to lean towards tax credits because of the ease of program administration. Um, and I'm sure Stan can talk about administering a grant program versus you know, a, the IRS administering a, a, a tax incentive. Um, there's also some dynamics in Congress that make it easier to provide a tax credit or a, a tax deduction as opposed to a new, new funding, new grant program. So I think a lot of what happens in that decision making is more of a, a political calculus than a uh, a research base, what do people respond to best um, from what I've seen? Just as a, just as a general observation, um, if you try to fund a grant program, somebody's got to make a decision to appropriate that money. And so there's got to be this, this proactive step. And given the way, uh, again, uh, funding gets allocated to programs, uh, you know, that, it's difficult because in essence, these days, a lot of times you're having to take money away from something else in order to fund something new. Tax credit on the other side is, uh, you know, it, it's kind of below the surface. It's, it's a leak out of the system, if you will, on the revenue side. And so that it, it, it hides itself a little bit better. It, it can produce a similar result. But again, the, the mechanisms to get where you want to go, you know, they vary. Um, again, clarity. <laughs> if you really want to know what's going on, it, it's, it's sometimes difficult to understand the impact of uh, tax credits for a while. We also have to make sure that the mitigation programs are also not taxable. That's a huge problem. 
it doesn't make any sense at all that if you get like the brace program that I just qualified for this year, but then they came like your house is fine. Uh, that would have been like $3,000. I would have claimed it on my taxes and then I'd have to um, pay income tax on it. So those are that's another thing that we need to fix. Um, a side note, uh, Reese May is also here from SVP. He is also on the task force. And so is anybody else that I'm missing on the task force that's currently here? We have a couple task force organizations. I know Tiffany's here from Team Rubicon for Jeff. Uh, I think someone from the Turner Center is here for Ben Metcalf. So. You can stand for fun if you want to. Or wave. It'll feel good. Please, please, please do come find us. Yeah. Don't let this be the end of the conversation. We'd really love to hear your thoughts. And I'm on the task force too. And so um, consider me a conduit for any of your ideas, frustrations, anything like that. I'm very honored. And I love the fact that Stan remembered me from a HUD meeting um, 2018. I think I left my purse in that meeting and I had to go back and find it. And if you've ever been to the HUD building, you know that you may as well like just give away the rest of your life. So it was really hard. Anyway, thank you all so much for all of your hard work. We appreciate you.